crashes over me, crashes over me, for you are false, and you are not against us, champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in, and I'm sure Let's just lift our hands in this place tonight. And I want to begin to declare these words again. And there's something powerful about declaring words even if you don't feel them. In fact, that's even more powerful because what you're doing is you're declaring the words against what the enemy has told you, against what your emotions have told you, against what your circumstances have told you. That's the power of worship. It's lifting God high and declaring the truth in the face of lies. So that's what we're going to do tonight. Even if you do not feel this way, I encourage you all the more to say, Oh, I'm sure-hearted, I'm sure-footed, I'm sure-footed. And when the sun, and when the sun calls me, I will go. Just declare those things tonight. Say it. I'm sure-hearted, I'm sure-footed, and when the sun calls on me, I will go. Just keep saying that. I'm sure-hearted, I'm sure-footed, and when the sun
presence of my I feel your glory, Lord. Lift your hands across the house if you would. Pastor gave me permission to go ahead and come up and share something for a moment. Feel your glory, Lord. It's pouring out. Come on, lift your hands. Many, many years ago, I saw a vision of a church, in a giant church of this big bucket of oil being poured out. And when I just walked out over here, I saw it again. Some of you, he's going to anoint you with gladness right now. Won't the Spirit lead me? Let your Spirit lead me. Oh, I'm desperate for you. Oh, come on, begin to cry out to him. Father, I pray in the spirit right now, you begin to gird up the arms of every warrior in this place with such a fierce fire to begin to cry out to you. Father, as we stand in your rain, wash off what the world has tried to put on us and pollute us. We cry out for an encounter tonight. Come on. Come on. Come on. Hey! We're going to roar, Father. Sing that, sing that. There's a mantle. There's a mantle. 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 Mantle.
Hello, Sarah. The Father loves to dance with you. The Father loves to, come here. He loves to dance with his daughter. No, no, we're not done. We're not done. We're not done. There's something that tried to wrap itself around you over the last couple of days. And, it, and, the, and the Lord said, I'm undoing you in my presence. He's unwrapping. You're getting undone. You're getting undone. Something is trying to wrap. I break that thing. Whoa! No fear. No fear. Been hearing stuff. No fear, no fear, no fear. Okay. You don't know who I am. I love that. I love that. Just like I didn't know who that evangelist was over there, but I'll find out. And then I realized it was Charles Parham. <laughs> Reinhard Bunke told me the evangelist is the redheaded stepchild of most denominations, and I have found that out. See, when humanity meets divinity, that's an altar call. And when you begin to have the encounter, about three years ago, secretly I dealt with oppression, depression. No one knew it. And, oh, I would say hope deferred makes the heart sick. I would say a longing fulfills the tree of life. I would quote the word. I would dance. I would dance. I would cry out. Traveling and speaking to tens of thousands and been couldn't tell nobody about it just first time anybody heard about it was when I just wrote my new book unqualified because that's who God's using he's using the oops the accidents and the nobodies he's not using the professionals no more he's not building those that have learned to have maintenance faith faith versus miraculous faith he's raising up the ones that are the rag and the hand of God sent to clean up the message it's Romans 11 verse 5 so too at the present time I have a remnant chosen by grace and he's hidden himself 7,000 that will preach to the nations but I'll never forget, he woke me up. I was in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, preaching. I woke up early one morning, and I felt the heaviness. It was trying to sneak back. Anybody ever had the cloud of despair try to follow you? You remember, remember Charlie Brown, the Peanuts character, uh, the pig, pig pen. I mean, that brother, everywhere he went, he had that dust. Yeah, I know what that that's it is. And Because the great ones, the anointed ones, uh, have bullseyes. And... and um, uh, but I'll, I'll never forget, the Spirit of the Lord said to me, I want you to get up and go dance before me. And I said, Lord, I can't do that. I'm not a dancer. I'm so white. And, and no, when I get to heaven, I'm going to be black. Well, my daughter's Asian, so she always tells me I'm going to be Blasian. And, and, um, and all, 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 the, all black people are going to be white. I am so sorry. You got to deal with that. And uh, you're trying to dance, and you're just going to trip. I mean, it's going to be bad news. But I'll never forget, the Lord woke me up, and I'm telling this for somebody, because the Lord made me go out and dance in the battlefields of Gettysburg. I put my wife on FaceTime, and I began to repent for being many times an on-fire revivalist, a great dad or husband, or a discouraged, defeated failure. I started dancing. She's on FaceTime. I'm weeping, and she's talking to me, and I'm dancing. The Lord said to me, go dance where others have died. And you have to say, I'm not dealing with that. Now, I'm hitting this for a second because there's people that walked in here with heaviness. And it's not the right heaviness. It's not the, it's not the Second Chronicles chapter 5, what we preached on, on conference call yesterday with our whole team, where the glory was so heavy. Bend us, O Lord. But I was getting ready for service tonight, and I am literally standing in front of what I've, I can, am beginning to consider. The, the, I asked the Lord for a best friend, so he brought me James. That's, that's, I have never said that, but that's truth. I was getting ready for service tonight, and suddenly I saw a lion with a net over him with weights on it and he's laying on his side and his mouth was muzzled and I saw lightning strike and suddenly the lion rose up jumped back up and crouched and froze in the air while I was praying and he said 
This house was the lion that has been netted by secularism, by perversion, by fear, and by religion. And greed. Greed was the last thing. I don't know the history of this house. I'm going to learn it. Secularism, perversion, fear, and greed. Those were the weights. And the Lord spoke to me over this house and he said, I am about to release this house like a lion again. I saw it. So I had to come up and share that with you because the Spirit of the Lord is here. And these walls scream revival, but revival is when God gets so sick and tired of being misrepresented, he shows up. That's revival. Revival is when we suddenly, I don't really want revival. Forgive me for saying that. And I, I've just started saying that in the last two years because it's time for truth to rise up. I don't want revival. I want reformation. Reformation changes culture. Revival come and go. Reformation is a changing of culture and a mindset. And we've moved into such a very, I said this on Sid Roth a couple days ago. I said, uh, perversion has been released on America, but the, but the gospel is still the good news. We're living in a time where truth is a new hate speech and the enemy of truth is silence. And God is saying, I'm looking for someone that will stand up and declare truth and look into the, the face of perversion. And, and you got to understand, what I, what I preach will get banned in the next few years. It'll be illegal because it's already illegal in Australia and Canada. And so there's some things you're not supposed to say anymore. But, but I, I read God's word and it is so politically incorrect, it's crazy. And so, um, in fact, James would have got kicked out of every church in America today. There's no way they'd have that mug because he says, you know, wash your hands, you sinners, purify your hearts, you double-minded. And, uh, and, and so what I want to say to you is, is, is there's an anointing on this place, but we're not quite done. We're going to sing another worship song, and I'm going to turn it to pastor, and then I'm going to come and share. But I don't know what you came for, but flying here, I was in Georgia speaking last night, and my precious gift, my wife, uh, Karen, uh, I'll show you her picture in a minute because she's hot. Amen. God takes care of her, brother. I'm telling you, it don't matter if you're ugly as long as you're anointed to get a hot wife and um and I didn't know truth. I mean, you look at ugly dudes and you're like, bro. And, uh, but ladies, you'll get your presence in heaven. But here's what you got to understand is I was in Georgia last night and I went to bed last night and Debbie, right. Oh, okay, Lord. Okay, Lord. I lose the best pins. Right. Right. No, no, right. You're brilliant. That's what the Lord says. He says, you're brilliant. And there's been a war against your mind as of late. Busyness, exhaustion, tired. But the Lord says, you're brilliant. Right. You got to right. Got to right. Got to right. Okay. I'll help you. I'll help you. Here's what I want to say over the next few minutes. The Spirit of the Lord is going to move. When humanity meets divinity, that is an altar call. And the reason why I said that is because there's going to come a moment of encounters. And we've been seeing a lot of crazy miracles lately with scars disappearing off cutters. And that's, some of, that's kind of thing that happens in our service. Because when the love of the Father enters in, enters in, He not only heals the inside, but He transforms the outside. So we're seeing a lot of those kind of miracles lately. So I don't know what God's going to do. But, but I'm going to go ahead and set the, set the, uh, set the platform, if you would. And, and I honor you. God gave you to me. God gave you to me. I'm going to be selfish with you. This voice, this voice, it's the nations. So what does God do when he gets ready to use somebody? He has to put them in a cave for a season. The cave dwellers. The cave of Adullam, which means justice for the people. He has to put them in there and say, okay, let's, let's, let's abandon that kingdom for this kingdom. That's what he said to David and his mighty men. I see sons running in the door. I see children running in the door. I see, I see, I see children coming. Y'all been fighting for children, and it's like you cannot get children. And, but the Lord says the children are the key to the growth of this house. Not great music, even though it's the best. Not great preaching even though it's the best the Lord says children are the key to this area the fatherless that's who he's close to we must break an orphan spirit off of generation 
first time I held my little girl in China in the orphanage, she was nine months old, and she reached up, and she had never been around a man in her life because the orphanage she came from. And I held my daughter, and it all started with my wife having a dream of a baby crying and uh, saying, Mommy, come get me. And I'm holding my little girl, Abigail, in my arms, and she reaches up and rubs my face and says, Baba. And the interpreter, who we later, later led to the Lord, said, I cannot understand what just happened. She just called you Daddy and doesn't even know the word. Don't you know I buy, I buy, I buy her whatever she wants? I, I mean, I, I own stock in Justice and Buckle and Disney. But here's what I want to tell you tonight. We're going to sing this again. You ready? You getting unwrapped? Okay. Uh, yeah. This is the night where we set the pace. Amen. Let's worship. Let's worship for a minute longer. Come on. Let's worship. Let's worship for a minute longer. You ready? Jesus, take me 
Father, I thank you tonight that you've ordained this night from the foundation of the world. And God, I thank you tonight is a night of breakthrough. God, I thank you tonight is a night that lids are removed from this place, God, from this region, from people tonight, God. We thank you, Father, that that lion is roaring in this place tonight, Jesus. Father, we trust you. We thank you for your presence. You know, it's so funny to me because, I mean, Pat is just, just an absolute hero in my heart. And, you know, he leaned over to me for a moment and he just looked and said, do people take this for granted here? And when a man comes into this church that packs stadiums out, that travels the world for God, guys, we have to open our eyes again. Some of us have gotten too sensitive to this. We've desensitized ourselves to what we have in this place. And when ministers show up here every Sunday and, and people that travel the world continually show up on our services, we still look around like nothing's happening. Friends, we cannot fall victim to the leaven of the Pharisees. God's glory is in this place today. I believe that you don't leave this place the way you came in this building. And I'm laying on this altar nothing, hiding, saying, God, I'm believing for breakthrough up in here. And we've got to do the same. Because you pray too much. There's too many words spoken over this land. They tell you that wood contains sound. And this is our last, I, this is our absolute last service regionally with these pews. It's done. It's the last week, man. And pretty soon they'll be sawed up into 45 pews that I'll have too many people that want to buy them. Little benches for your house. But what do these walls say? And I'm going to tell you right now, this better be the most radical generation that has ever prophesied within these pews. This better be the most radical band of people that have ever heard the word of the Lord in this place. And when I get to heaven and that, that cloud of witnesses greets us, I want them to remember this night and say, gosh, I knew my prayers were answered when I saw that service that night. I know that the baton is being passed and we're believing for greater things. So, Father, we thank you tonight for change. We thank you for this next few, few services here, God that you would such leave, you already have God, but leave such a deposit and everybody watching by way of web tonight, I pray that you would invade every household, every nation, every tribe and tongue and let the same fire that burns in this place burn to every person watching in the name of Jesus, we thank you Father for breakthrough, healing, deliverance and change in Jesus name Come on, amen. Let's give the Lord a hand tonight, friends. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Do me a favor. Say hello to somebody. Please do. We got a lot of folks you may not know up in here tonight. Just say hello briefly to somebody. Come on.
Hallelujah. Bless you, friends. You can be seated for a moment. Thank you, Lord. Come on, be seated if you can, friends. Hallelujah. Come on. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, let's be seated, friends. want to welcome you all here and those of you watching online to uh, Engaging Heaven Church. And uh, I'm Pastor James Levesque, if I haven't had the privilege of meeting you. And although it's hot, it's not as hot as I thought it would be late August. Come on, somebody. We got the George Whitfield air conditioner up in here, which basically isn't one. Friends, we got a fan and a hole in the ceiling. Come on, somebody. But... Uh, <clears throat> Again, we want to welcome you all. We're so really excited and honored, and really it's just a privilege in my heart to have Pat Shastline here. Can we give him a hand, friends? What an honor it is. And um, just quick, like, I want to share with you a few things before I get to introduce my dear friend. Um, we have a lot of stuff happening tonight, obviously. We have our service tomorrow morning at 11 o'clock. Pat will be ministering again with us. And there was a little bit of a confusion. Sun this Sunday night, there's not the healing meeting. It's September 11th on a Friday night. So mark your calendars. Let it known. September 11th, we're going to be doing a night of signs and wonders here. And we're telling everybody. How many know some sick people? Come on, the rest of you aren't being honest. We're going to ask everybody to bring the sick, the lame, the crippled. Our last healing night, the, you know, there was a man that was supposed to get his legs amputated, and the Lord healed him. Come on. And so we're believing God on September 11th. So um, mark your calendars. This Sunday we won't be doing it, but September 11th. And then also <clears throat> um, in October, you want to you wanna prepare for this, 23rd and 24th, we have Awake New England. Uh, yeah, with David Hogan is going to be here with us, Brian Simmons, Dr. Mark Spitzbergen. We are, it's going to be 10, 2, and 7 on Saturday. And I'm, how many have heard of David Hogan? A mighty man of faith. Even Dr. Mark, you are in for an absolute treat. And David Hogan, you have to understand, he, he contacted us out of like a, two years ago. And he said, I'm on my way to Africa, and the Lord told me I'm going to be at your church <laughs> October 23rd and 24th of 2015. And, you know, basically I was like, yes, Lord. So um, we're excited about it. There's not a cost for it. It's going to be free like all the events we do. But I want you to get the word out. Um, we may have to cut it off. There's so many people contacting us. But this will be the first time he's been in this area. And, I mean, he's had over, seen over, I think, 500 people raised from the dead and uh, some ma just powerful miracles. You can YouTube the dude. He's crazy. He doesn't even have a like, website. He's like this crazy prophet dude that just like roams the earth and just basically goes uh, wherever he can. Um, Aaron, you texted me, bro, and my phone went off. Thank you so much. But uh, uh, I'm not talking to anybody in here. But you want to join us in October, and every, every month we do events, so you don't want to miss that and uh, give you an opportunity uh, to join us. Also, I want to welcome everybody watching online. Can we give them a hand tonight? We have hundreds of people tuning in every service, uh, like 10, 15, sometimes 20 nations. So we thank all of you for tuning in and joining us here uh, on this powerful night. But um, do me a quick favor, friends. Open with me in your Bibles to Matthew 10. I want to share a quick word and then give time for uh, Pat, which I have to tell you, just him being here this afternoon I, I told somebody that I felt like such a rich deposit was already released in me. And so I'm so anticipating what the Lord's going to do tonight. I really believe he set this up. Um, thank you, Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, if you got it, say got it. In verse 40, Jesus says this, He that receives you receives me. And he that receives me receives him that sent me. He that receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And he that receives the righteous man and the name of the righteous man will receive that reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones only a cup of water in my name or in the name of a disciple, assuredly, I'll tell you, he'll by no means lose his reward. Say honor. You know, one thing I want New England to be known for is honor. And one reason I believe that Jesus had to tell you, you know, if you receive a prophet, if you honor a prophet, what does that even mean? That means we've got to recognize who's in our midst. That means we have to know that if God is sending us a prophet, we don't treat that person like he's just somebody that doesn't have that mantle. Do you understand me? 
There's something about honor. In Mark 6, it says they, they, they just thought that he was Joseph's son, and they thought, isn't that just Jesus? And, and then it says that he couldn't do no mighty miracles. Had nothing to do with Jesus trying and can't. It's the fact that when we honor Jesus for who he really is, some people still can't see who he really is. When you honor Jesus for who he is, you release the miraculous that's on his life. When you put your faith there for who that person is, then it's released in your life. Are you with me? I'm going to tell you tonight, one, he is one of the greatest men of God I know is Pat Shasline. He is, and, and he's not going to sit up here and boast his credentials and tell you everybody he knows and what, what positions he's held in some of the largest denominations on the planet. I mean, just, it's unbelievable to me just hearing the stories and where he's been. And let me tell you what else is assigned to the house. These men, Pat Shasline and David Hogan, they, they the Lord spoke to them to come to this place. And they're not looking for crowd size. They're not, they're not demanding an honorarium. Blow your mind. They have every right to in their place, position, and budgets. And he goes, the Spirit of the Lord told me I'm supposed to be there. And I'm going to tell you it's an answer to some of our prayers tonight. I'm going to tell you. We've been asking that God would begin to release messengers and that he would begin to move in a mighty way. And I promise you there's times that we just need a little bit of some things from the outside to change our perspective and to see some things happen. And tonight we have a prophet in our midst. We have a mighty man of God that God has brought. First time he's been in Connecticut. And I really believe God. And I love the fact that he's undercover. I love the fact that most of you don't have a clue who he really is. It makes Because he gets up here, the glory falls, and you're like, what in the world is this dude? Who is this? I love that. And I'm believing tonight that absolutely things are going to be ripped off your life, and your mind's going to be changed, and God's going to transform you. Are you with me? The man hears from God on a radical level, and he has such an anointing and authority for regions, and I believe God has sent him here tonight. And we, because of that, we have an opportunity to honor him. Because of that, you and I have an ability, those of you watching by home, I'm talking to you too. We have an opportunity collectively to bless those that grow in our midst. And I thank God that, that, that absolutely God is sending men that have no requirements, major heroes in the faith that are saying, I know that God is doing something here and I have to come. So I thank God for that. I want to give us an opportunity with that said to bless our speaker and, and everything for this weekend. I want to give an opportunity for us to sow a seed. And I believe it's a great honor to give. I'm going to tell you something. When you see radical giving, you see the spirit of God poured out. Absolutely true. When I meet people that are absolutely bound, it's always connected somewhere to the pocketbook. It's just how life is. But I don't want that to be said about this church. I don't want it to be said about this region. So tonight, I want to ask you to ask the Lord what you can do, what you can sow tonight into this powerful ministry. He'll tell you more about it. Obviously, he's a great author. All the things that he's doing, we're so blessed to have his interns here also. And, uh, and I want to give us an opportunity. Amen? So do me a favor. Grab the envelope in front of you in your, in your seat there. It's like one of the last times we're saying that, dude. And uh, you can make your checks out to Engaging Heaven Church or EHC. Every single thing you give tonight, I don't care how large it is, is going to go to the ministry. And I want to bless. I want to I want to leave every speaker that comes in this house with a deposit. And uh, and we've been true to that over our whole life here. I want this house to be known as a house of giving, and I want us to partner with Heaven. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Those of you watching online, I want to encourage you tonight. I know you've already been blessed. I know we already sense the spirit of the Lord here. I want to encourage you to partner with us. Bust out your little wallet. Go into your pants if you're sitting there in your boxers. Get your credit card. It's a secure site. I want you to donate to this. Come on. This isn't, you know, this ain't just freebies here. This ain't just peekaboo. Come on, man. I want to encourage you to partner with what's going on here. And I want it to be a blessing to our speaker. Amen. Ushers, come forward. We're going to pray. I want to give Pat as much time as we can. I know the Lord's given him a burning word for us, and I'm, I'm so eager to receive what Father has for us tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, Jesus, we thank you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We thank you for the opportunity to honor the men and women that you have brought into New England, God. We say yes. We receive everything that you've placed on their life, and we honor tonight through our finances, through our giving, partnering with what you're doing around the world through this ministry. We thank you for the whole I Am Remnant movement. We thank you for the multitude of tens of hundreds of thousands that have been mobilized by this message. And God, tonight we partner with it in the spirit. We thank you that everything is given to the kingdom's cause. We sow into eternity tonight. In the name of Jesus, amen. Bless you, friends, as you give. Thank you, Jesus. I had the honor 
I'll never forget the day Pastor Allen from the river at Tampa called me. And he said, uh, there was a youth pastor down in Miami who had like, I don't know, 20,000 people in the church in his youth group. I mean, it's so odd. And he said, uh, through, you know, Pastor Maldonado's church and through the, I think Frank was the youth pastor's name. He said, I met this man who just called me out of the blue. He said his name was Pat Shaslon. And I've heard of the name. And I said, really? And Alan said, dude, when the guy started prophesying over me, I felt the fire on my body like few times I've ever felt in my life. And he said, I can't believe that a man like this would even contact me. And he said, if you get the opportunity to meet him, I know it's going to change your life. And last fall, we went down to the river, and, and it was just an absolute divine appointment. Obviously, that was the weekend that Prophet Angel, a bunch of stuff was going on down there. But I knew the reason I was there. Although you saw me get a word on this, I knew the reason I was there was to meet Pat. And the minute I met him, it was like we got the fire from the same place. You know, and, 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 and let me say this publicly, because I've never said stuff like this before. God's really used him to heal my heart, because I've been through major stuff. In ministry, I've seen stuff behind the scenes that I wouldn't even want to break your bubble with. I've been a part of great moves of God and some that, ma- that majorly fell. And I realized through my relationship with you, man, that God used you to heal my heart. That I realized I turned away from opportunities because I didn't want to go down that road And Pat really showed me an example of somebody that is down a broad ministry road but didn't compromise his convictions. And in the last year, he's pulled me out, I'm telling you, out of a cave I was in and said, man, what's on you is going to go around the world again. And, you know, and at a young age, God has just used him to pull it out of me. And I'm so honored and indebted to you, man, as a friend. And I just thank God for a covenant partnership. I love you more than you'll ever know. And I'm so thankful for a lifetime of ministry together. And uh, he's a hero in the faith. I'm telling you right now, we're standing in the midst of greatness. Can we honor tonight Pat Shasline? Come on up, man. Come on. I love and honor you, bro. We're family. Can I give you something real quick? Can I give you something? Let me give you something. Oh, I honor you. You may be seated across the house. I, uh, I'm so blessed. I, you know, uh, Pastor, I, I just uh, wrote in the last two, two and a half years, three new books. And um, in fact, I think you're supposed to write for the same publisher for Charisma. But in, in the first book I wrote, it's called Why Is God So Mad at Me? And, and how many of you know he's not mad at you? He's mad about you. I may preach that tomorrow. I don't know. But it's about the love of the Father because my, I have three anointings on my life, and it is to, number one, restore integrity to the pulpit. Number two, uh, raise up the remnant. But number three is break an orphan spirit off the bride. And, uh, uh, I, you know, I don't want, I, I honestly believe that about 80% of the body of Christ is going to get to heaven, and when they experience his love, they're going to spend 30 seconds questioning what they did on earth. And... Um, But I I wrote the the last two books. I was out jogging one day. I don't really jog. I I loiter. But um, I'm out. I'm out. I'm out jogging in Dallas two years ago. And uh, actually, it's been three or four years ago. I don't know how long it was. Uh, But uh, the Lord spoke to me. He's going to raise up a remnant in America, a remnant, a remnant. And all through Bible, all through the history, there's been remnants. This house represents the remnant, those that led the move of God. And and uh, in that remnant, the Lord gave me a manifesto. One day I couldn't hear from the Lord, so I went out to the track and I started walking around and I said, I need an open heaven. And it opened and, and, he, and uh, he gave me 34 prophetic statements, and, uh, such as the remnant consists of the failures, the fatherless, and the forgotten, and, uh, and the freedom fighters whose pedigree is that of a scarred Savior. And the remnant doesn't stop where they should have died because they know Jesus didn't. Let me read some of these to you because I'm giving you this as a gift. And um, the remnant doesn't need the stage, but rather a place to call home to bring a weary guest um the uh, there's a couple that i wonder the the remnant includes the apostle with the worn out garments the smiling prophet the opposite of what we see in magazines christian magazines the the transparent pastor the weeping missionary and the teacher with tools in hand and the servant evangelist um uh the the, the remnant walks among lost humanity not screaming insult or provoking slander but invading with light that which is only known darkness there's a reason why i'm reading some of these um 
uh, because the Lord gave this to me. And as he gave this to me, I wrote it in 45 minutes on my phone, all 34 prophetic words. The remnant understands the fruit of the Spirit is not a salad for a church potluck, but rather the diet of a lifetime. The, the remnant knows the gifts of the Spirit are not for evangelical, charismatic, and Pentecostal talent shows, but rather weapons of dying leaders who have chosen spirit over flesh and freedom over slavery. So there's 34, but at the bottom it says the Levesque's are remnant, and I had that created for you. And, and then, um, and, and then uh, also, a lot of people would take this as offensively, uh, but the, 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 then the Lord said, write another book called The Unqualified, because I'm the most unqualified. I'm a drug dealer's kid. <laughs> and my dad got saved when I was five, and you know if you're a drug dealer and you get saved, you become a preacher. And, um, but, but then the Lord gave me another book that just came out in June, and you know all about it, but I think you wrote in that. Uh, you you're in that book, and, and um, the, the unqualified stand in awe of the love of God that rescued them from a life of pain. Um, it just, uh, th uh, this is 43, that was 34, this is 43 prophetic words that he gave me one afternoon when I was flying. And um, the unqualified understand without the active work of the Holy Spirit in their life, they'll become an echo instead of a voice. Um, the unqualified would rather be in a, a small room of the desperate than a large stadium of the satisfied. And so, again, as another gift, but it says, the, because some people would take this offensively, but it's the highest compliment. The Levesque's are the unqualified. And so I, I bless you with those. And from, from me, I love you. I bring you greetings tonight from my beautiful wife, Karen. Uh, she, in tomorrow morning, kicks off a tour. There she is right there. I'm, I have a major lust issue with that girl. And... Uh, 25 years of marriage, haha, <laughs> and uh, y'all write some checks for that, and so um, we're going to be going to Mexico in a couple weeks and celebrating, and dancing like David did in the streets, naked, and so um, I know that's awkward, I've never said that before, probably won't either, and if you're watching, don't write emails, and um, but, but I, I feel like I'm at home. It's so rare that I ever walk in. I preach. Last night I was in Georgia. Uh, next week, uh, Tuesday, I go to Singapore uh, where, they, where they're seeing a mighty move of God. And, and then the next week I go to Kentucky, then San Antonio with Pastor Hagee. Oh, Pittsburgh, San Antonio. And then I, uh, from there to Orlando and then, and then Mexico and then Phoenix. That's what kind of schedule I do. It's kind of crazy what the Lord does. And, and I do want to encourage you, by the way, if you don't have the three books, please, or actually the four books, because Karen's new book, when she heard the song, um, yeah, brave. He makes me brave. She wrote the last chapter of books called Brave, and it's very real, and it's called Dehydrate, and it's about intimate counters at the well. And uh, she's actually, that's where she's at. She's launching that starting tomorrow. And so uh, some great leaders have wrote, on the, uh, wrote in it. And, but this is her new book. So please check those books out back there. And, and you say, well, I'm not much of a reader. That's okay. I'm not much of a writer. And so, but I promise if you'll read it, I had, a, I had a pastor tell me the other day, he just read Unqualified two times straight through. And, and, and he said, I sat in my office weeping uncontrollably because of the failure spirit that comes on great leaders. And so from the I Am Remnant message, families that are seeing outbreaks of the fire of God in their houses reading these books together. And so please check that out. You can check out the entrepreneurial series of new prophetic word God just gave me. God is raising up entrepreneurs in the kingdom. Priests and kings that are going to start businesses and write books. And, and that's another thing. I may get into that a little bit tomorrow morning. But, but uh, lastly, um, about six weeks ago, the Lord prophetically spoke to me uh, through about six different people to launch a thing called RaiseTheRemnant.com. And what is that? It's to raise up preachers from 8 years old to 80 years old. And it's just a, it's just a weekly. You're going to be doing a video with me tomorrow. It's a weekly video. You don't do homework or anything like that, but it's teaching how to preach, how to write sermons, how to um, give altar calls, how to write a book. Just did a whole 20-minute video on how to write a book. Please check out RaiseTheRemnant.com. It'll feed you. Um, and Pastor, Pastor James is going to be a great a great part of that is he's going to partner with me in that. He just found out. And so, um, will you, will you partner with me? Let's do it together. Okay. I need a partner in it because, uh, we're going to raise up. It's been prophesied. We'll raise up millions to preach the gospel in the last year. Since January one, we've seen over 30,000 come to Christ. Those are real numbers. We've seen over 2000 called into ministry. We've seen thousands filled with the spirit. So I want to go ahead and set the stage, the platform of his glory. 
Four years ago, I had a major encounter with God. One of my heroes that I had preached for, David Wilkerson, was killed in a car accident one night. And it was the same, it was the night after a giant tornado came through the southeast. I live in Birmingham, Alabama. It came through and, and it destroyed 10,000 homes and 220 people lost their life. But uh, in fact, I was at home. It was on a Wednesday morning when it hit and, and uh, they told us to go get our children from school. I mean, it already had done major damage in Mississippi and then it was coming down through Tuscaloosa where my family lives an hour away and my brother who pastors the church had over 100 families lose their home and it starts coming towards Birmingham and I walked outside and it was coming towards our house and the newscaster said, get down, Trustful. That's where I live is Trustful. And my wife runs out and says, what are you doing? I'm just watching it because I'm a redneck. Amen. I mean, you just got to watch it. I mean, there's like cows flying in. And, um, but the very next day, laying in my front yard, um, uh, there was, there was debris and we found a phone bill from 300 miles away and, and, uh, or a couple hundred miles away and all kinds of stuff. But laying in my front yard, soaking wet was one sheet of paper. I call it my letter from heaven. Now it was about four and a half years ago. It was April, as a matter of fact, 2011. And so, uh, uh, April 28th, I call it my letter from heaven because laying in my front yard was a sheet of paper that had blown out of somebody's book that was blown out of somebody's house. And, and I later found out it was a book called Armageddon, the Middle East and the Oil Crisis. Now you do understand we're living in the last days. I wrote about in the new book, Unqualified, a vision, a dream that the Lord gave me of a giant wave that is going to sweep across America. I go very deep into it. I shared it in D.C. last summer. That was right when the Lord gave it to me. But the wave will be the wave of an outpouring, one last final awakening before the return of Christ. He's coming back. In fact, if you miss it, I need you to go to house, my house and feed my demon-possessed dog because she ain't going. And... Um, Yorkies, Yorkies guard the gates of hell. Amen. Her nickname's Legion. And so now, but laying in my front yard was one sheet of paper and Josh, who's still with us, found it and he left it laying there by my front steps. I pull into my driveway. I get out and I see this sheet of paper and I bend over and pick it up and it's soaking wet. And all it said, I call it my letter from heaven. It had fallen out of a book written in 1974 called Armageddon, the Middle East and the Oil Crisis by John Wolvern. And all it said was topping even these disasters will come a world war. And it begins to speak of the end times. I begin to shake uncontrollably. I went into the house. I couldn't talk for two hours. I went up to my prayer room. I received a text that, that, uh, uh, what I call him a prophet, David Wilkerson had just been killed in a car accident, I received a text from his nephew, and I began to weep, and I said, Lord, what are you trying to say to me? He said, prepare my bride. The day of being the youth guy all over America ends tonight. And I began to shake in the glory of the Lord. I was shaking so hard that my shirt ripped. Now, why would I tell you that? Because since that time, four and a half years ago, everything has changed. But see, I must go down a road for a few moments because you have to understand, I happen to believe you can only preach where you survived. And I happen to believe... I'm going to get very intense now. You need to hold on. But you will feel the glory in a moment. It's going to sweep over you. And again, the altar area is open. And by the way, I want one of those post in front too. And so when you, yeah, I got to have one for my house. I'm going to build an altar with it. <laughs> it's going to be fun. Sorry, private conversation. Got to buy one of these pews. It just fires me up. But you have to understand where I'm going tonight. Because I believe we're called to be mobile upper rooms. I believe that when you walk into places, demons should be jumping out windows, not attacking you, but running. Because something on you is different. And I want you to look at the book of James. James, I must share a message. I wasn't sure where I was going to go with it. But I, I must share a quick message. See, every Saturday night when I go to bed, immediately I hear Revelation twenty two seventeen: The spirit and the bride says, come. So I'm going to preach a message. Tonight, simply titled, The Simeon Cry. Is it all right if I share that? The Simeon Cry. Because I've never fit in. I've worked at some of the largest churches in America, and I didn't fit in. 
I didn't fit in in college. I didn't fit in, in high school. All my report cards said talks too much, daydreams, very prophetic about my future. But God is raising up the misfits. He's raising up the ones that don't fit in the mode of the religious because somewhere along the way, we begin to realize that religion didn't save us. So what you have to understand is the Bible says in Romans 11 verse 5, so too at the present time there's a remnant chosen by grace. But look in your Bibles at James chapter 4 verse 8. Now I want to tell you a story real quick as I get into this because we're going to look at James chapter 4 verse 8. And, and this is what it says. And I use PowerPoint a lot and it's because I, it helps me stay focused. It doesn't matter if you do or not. And so... But it says, come near to God and he'll come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That is for the American church. That is from James the Greater, who wrote the Proverbs of the New Testament, which is the book of James. A lot of people don't realize that you could preach on James for 10 years and never get it all. He had his brains bashed out at 84 years old while preaching the gospel. He was a martyr. But what you have to understand is, I'll never forget, it was about three years ago. My little girl, my daughter Abigail, my gift from heaven... Now, my son is a youth pastor out in, in uh, uh, California, and, and Nate is, you're going to hear about my family, uh, Nate and Adrian. Nate has a youth ministry of about 1,500, and uh, my daughter-in-law is our gift, and they just had a grandson. You'll see him playing in the NFL. It's been prophesied. Get ready. Ha-ha. <laughs> First, he'll play for Alabama Roll Tide. And so... But what you got to realize, I like to introduce my family when I'm there for the first time, just so you know, because I, I, I love them. They're my own. They're the only ones I have to get to heaven. But about three years ago, we were down in Florida, maybe two and a half. I'm not sure. Maybe two. I'm down in Florida, and, and I was speaking a series of meetings, and my little girl loves Disney World. And so Abby wanted to go to Disney. And, and so all of a sudden, there's a, and I'm opening up with this, but I want you to get a hold of it. But all of a sudden, I, I said to her, she had always wanted to do this thing called Bibbidi Bobbidi Boutique, and it's where they turn you into a princess. Uh, at the castle, they, 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 they make you dress up like a princess, and, and it was awesome. I mean, she was excited, so I went online, or Karen did, one of us did, and we scheduled her a boutique. Now, listen, the, the price on the Internet is not the real price. It's a lie. So, anyway, that's not important, but... But all day long, Abby keeps saying to me, Daddy, we're going to the castle. We're going to the castle, Daddy. We're going to the castle. And I'm like, we're going to the castle. Just, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. And so at 6 o'clock, we walk up to the castle. And the inside of Cinderella's castle, now at Disney World, is a beauty shop, basically. And, and I start to walk in, and, and I look at my wife, and I said, I'll wait outside. I don't really want to do that. And, and she said, okay, they say it's 45 minutes to an hour. I'll text you when we're coming out. And Abby's fired up. I mean, she's so excited. And, and I said, okay. So the door shuts, and I take off running across Disney World to Frontierland. Because there in Frontierland, there's these manna, these deep-fried turkey legs. My God. But I'd already had one. So this was... I was trying to do it inconspicuously. So I take off running. I grab that, and, 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 and all of a sudden, um, they sell smart water there. It's not working yet. And, and so, that's <laughs> stupid, isn't it? And, and so all of a sudden, I'm running. I'm just running. I got my leg in my hand. I've got my water, and I'm running through Disney because I don't want my wife to catch me. I've got to eat this before she sees me. And so I go over to the side of the castle, and I'm just wearing the leg out. I mean, there's grease flying. People are walking by. People are tired. Men are exhausted. They're now being led by their children. And men would look up at me, and they'd, they'd see me just sitting there just wearing it out. And, and I just have to look at him and say, go on. Because you, you could tell they wanted a bite. And so finally, all of a sudden, ding, I look down. My wife texts me and says, we're coming out. And I'm like, oh, dear God. And I'm like wiping the grease. And, and, and I just throw the leg in the moat. And, and uh, I've got my smart water. And my little girl comes running out. Now, my daughter's Chinese. She is a gymnast. You'll see her in the Olympics. My daughter takes off running towards me, and I scream, You're the most beautiful little 
little girl that's ever lived. And she takes off running and jumps in the air, crouching tiger head and anointing. And as she jumps in the air, I'm holding my smart water and I have a choice. As I'm screaming how beautiful she is, let go of what's in my hand or take what's important. So immediately out in the courtyard in front of the castle, I just throw the water and I grab her and I spin her around. If you knew her story, you'd understand. You're not getting what I'm saying. There comes a moment, church, where you let go of what's not important to start picking up what is. There comes a moment where you got to release to God what's been holding you. I didn't need the water at that moment. I needed to hold my little princess. Is somebody awake tonight? Give my God a praise offering. And see, what you've got to understand is the remnant has decided at all costs. We will not allow, not allow the next generation to speak of the last generation as those who did not want to see the move of God. And so tonight, I must tell you this word. Two years ago, I was in Singapore and I received a text from a spiritual father named Reinhardt Bunky. And he said, meet me at my hotel tonight for supper. You're here preaching. I'm here preaching. Let's meet for supper downtown. And I said, yes, sir, I will be there. I looked at my host for the very place I'm going on Tuesday. And I said, I must leave. I cannot stay for tonight's service. I have been summoned by a father. And because I believe honor opens the doorways over your life. It hands keys to your next destiny. I just believe honor. In fact, I must do this very quickly. I honor you too. And this house honors you. Thank you for walking in purity. Thank you for carrying come on come on no 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 stand up come on because you don't even realize when you show honor it is exploding your destiny it is opening doors it rolls out a red carpet come on we honor you tonight thank you for believing you could plant a church in a city that has forgotten him do you love your pastors give the lord one more praise come on and you may be seated we're not done but I'm sitting with Pastor Bunky, and all of a sudden we're having supper, and I'm very quiet when I'm with him. I know that's hard to believe, but I'm very, very quiet, and it's like sitting with Jesus, and I just cry. And, and he's pouring into me, and all of a sudden he says, on your flight home, God's going to give you a lifetime message that describes why you are the way you are. And all of a sudden, friends... I'm over the Indian Ocean. I'm laying in my seat. I'm laying down, actually. And all of a sudden, the Spirit of the Lord says to me, Simeon, cry. And I sat up in my chair. I was asleep. I was exhausted. Simeon, cry. I didn't know that it would become a chapter, and I am remnant. I had no idea. But you've got to follow me for a second because I want to preach about that. You have to understand, when I get to heaven, there's all kinds of people I'm going to hang out with. I'm going to hang out with my sister who we lost eight years ago. I'm going to hang out with my little grandmother who I could be preaching in Australia. I could be preaching in New Zealand. And she would wait up to hear how many got saved. I can still hear her at times cheering. I'm going to hang out with my Savior. And say, I just arrived with nothing left to do. What's the next assignment? When do we mount up and defeat hell? But first, we're going to have some food. And there ain't no fat grams in heaven. Amen. <laughs> and so, I'm going to be eating ice cream for breakfast in heaven. There's all these people I want to have coffee with because coffee will be in heaven. And, and, and it'll probably have a really cool biblical name like a lot of churches do with their little coffee shops. You know, like Holy Grounds. <laughs> it's so stupid. And Reinhardt Bunky always says, the less Holy Ghost we have, the more coffee and donuts we must. There's all these people I want to hang out with. I want to hang out with Jeremiah. We'll probably just cry. I want to hang out with Elijah and say, bro, you've got to be from the south. You rode a tornado. I want to hang out with David, but I'm going to require him to wear his pants when we worship. I want to hang out with Esther and say, what's it like spending a whole year to go to one service with the king and we can't get there on time? 
I want to hang out with Joel and say, Joel, I saw it. You said it. Peter's second, and on the day of Pentecost, standing on Solomon's colonnade, I saw it in the last days. He poured his spirit on all flesh. The sons and daughters prophesied. The old men dreamed dreams. The young men saw vision. Upon his bride, he poured out his glory. I saw it. Recently, I was in a service, and I don't think we've got video, but I just I watched this 8,000 at an I Am Remnant conference in, 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 in Hershey, Pennsylvania, begin to cry out and weep and wail and prophesy over the generation, scared the security to death because it was a bunch of union people as 13-year-olds and 18-year-olds and 28-years-old and 38-year-olds blew past them to cry out to God in the middle of the service. You go ahead and live in your box. I live in the field. I want to hang out with John and say, what made you so special that you were known as the disciple that loved him? I want to hang out with Paul because I love apologetics. I love people that can defend their faith. I am tired of stupid Christians. I want somebody that can walk up like Paul did to Mars Hill in front of an altar of an unknown God and begin to speak to the Greek philosophers and the humanists of the day and, the, and, and the, the, the Epicurus of the day and look at him and say, let me tell you who the real Savior is. I want to hang out with Paul. I want to get my brain stretched by that mug. There's one guy, I want to hang out with the thief because he's me. There's one guy I want to hang out with in heaven, though, that a lot of people don't talk about. His name is Simeon. Usually in our Christmas messages, we lead all the way up to the point of Luke chapter 2. We get to where he's at, but we never talk about him and we are missing it. Who has sent me? And you know what I've learned? You're never going to get anointed till you get forgotten. And the greater the anointing, the greater the isolation. And don't ask God to use you if He doesn't first have an opportunity to make you limp. Who is Simeon? An unknown person of the New Testament. A bygone scripture that we skip over, but we don't know who this is. But I know who Simeon is. In fact, I studied him. In fact, his name in the Aramaic is the same exact name as Simon Peter. His occupation was shepherd, writer. He belonged to what's called the Septuagint. What is that? That was a word that came later from Augustine of Hippo when he, he named the 70 writers. They're the ones that translated the Hebrew into the Greek koine. That gives us God's word today. Who is Simeon? You have to understand in the Orthodox Church, he's known as the God receiver. His death is celebrated on February the 3rd. There's a reason for me to tell you that. Who is Simeon? You're Simeon. We've never fit in, we've always been perimeter. God allows us to walk into this room and that room and this room, but we never get barely past the front door because we start seeing things and we back out. Because he trusts us with secrets. Standing last March in North Carolina about to go on Sid Roth's show, all of a sudden I'm standing there and I'm worshiping out on the street one morning and I'm getting ready to, to go back into the hotel to get ready to go be on with Sid. And all of a sudden I see a massive invasion upon our nation. I saw tanks pulling on the streets and I said, Lord, when is that? He said, soon. He said, the pain, the war will come from within. You need to listen closely. Your day of being a normal Christian has to stop now. Your day of treating God like some weekend warrior experience has got to stop now. Enough of this. Enough of this already. Quit, quit trying to secularize the glory of the Lord and think you've got this thing figured out. I'm telling you, there's going to be moments in this service tonight where he's going to bump into you and it's going to begin to sting at first because his glory brings forth redemption and redemption hurts. Covenant cost, it hurts to cut. And But you've got to understand. So look in your Bibles at Luke chapter 2, looking at verse 28. And I'll read it to you and and I use the message Bible sometime I don't know if I'm using it tonight but don't get offended it's just because of the groups that I preach to sometimes I, I like it at times and so but I, yeah, I believe this is the actually the NIV and when the time 
of their purification according to the law. Let me read what I have real quick, if you don't mind. I'm going to look at Luke chapter 2, looking at verse 28. Simeon took him in his arms, and he praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord! Pastor James, you remember last summer when God gave me the word Sovereign Lord. It's the opening chapter of Unqualified. Ah, Sovereign Lord, it means a holy cry of the Elohim, I am. <laughs> Anytime you see Sovereign Lord in God's word, it means preeminence. By the way, it's all over our nation. If you go to D.C., it's in different places that we serve a sovereign God. That means he doesn't need Congress's permission to declare what marriage is. It doesn't matter if the Supreme Court decides in 1858 that a black man is not a complete man. It doesn't matter in 1973 when they came to the decision and said that a baby can be aborted and murdered in a holocaust of this generation. And by the way, every time that happens, if uh, go, uh, any nation that kills their children, they only last three more generations anyway. That's 40 years, 44, 40, 40. But you have to understand, I write about that. And so you have to understand every time we begin to kill children, though, God always raises up a deliverer. Ha, ah, ha, Ah, Moses, Jesus, he's coming in the air. And so, but what you have to realize is, is, is when he is sovereign, and by the way, it doesn't matter what the Supreme Court says marriage is, God calls it Matthew 19, chapter 6, from the foundation of the earth, men and women. If that's offensive, get over yourself. He says, sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. You know what peace is? Peace is not an emotion. Peace is a place you have to live. Peace is the absence of condemnation. The peace that passes my little understanding. You may dismiss your servant in peace. Recently, John Kilpatrick from the Brownsville Revival, you didn't know him, he, he calls me and he says, son, when you go to a church, do like Jesus did when he started house churches, send them out two by two. He said, stand in front of that building and speak the word peace. And if it hits you back in the face, you know you're going to have a bad Sunday. Change everything. I was standing out here and I said, peace, but it didn't hit me back in the face. This is a house God created. Oh, yes, Lord. The glory of the latter house shall be greater than the former. That's what he just reminded me. Over this house. And then he goes on to say in verse 30. For mine eyes have seen your salvation. Oh excuse me I skipped something. Sovereign Lord as you have promised. You may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation. Which you have prepared in the sight of all nations. A light of revelation of the Gentiles. And the glory of your people Israel. Somebody say Simeon. See I am learning. The more you tell the truth. The smaller your circle gets. I'm learning that we're living in a very intense time where we would rather study Christian celebrity tweets than God's word. We'd rather watch them espouse humanism than God's word. In fact, you need to understand we're living in the day of celebrity Christianity, and that happens every 30 years, and then suddenly a major fall happens, a whole bunch of them, and that's going to happen in the next two years. But what you have to realize is, and I believe that with all my heart, but what you have to realize, you need to realize there was no celebrities in the Bible. In fact, the only red carpet in the Bible is where the blood of the martyrs was spilled. And the only rope off areas where they killed him. And the only celebrities in the Bible were children, actually. Jesus said, hey, let them through the rope line. But we're living in such a very intense time where grace is being preached without responsibility and repentance. And that just makes it universalism and, and religion. And we're living in a time where people are preaching. And they've snuck in among us. In Jude chapter 1, it speaks about that. Titus chapter 2, the, the, the true grace is given to live a godly lifestyle. It's that moment you get out from the bottom of the cross with the mourners and the gamblers. And you get on the cross with him so you can see the harvest. But there's a moment where God begins to, to show you that we're living in a very intense time. Where we have... Most churches have gotten so good at having Father, Son, and Holy Scripture, they don't need the Holy Spirit anymore. And when you water the blood down, you give the Holy Spirit a pink slip. But you have to understand something. I studied this recently. I wrote about it in Unqualified, the chapter called Rehiring the Holy Spirit, because I begin to study the great history. I talk about the Second Great Awakening in there. And by the way, every 20 years, somewhere in America, the outpouring comes. And, but I believe this next outpouring will be in many, many spots, and we are at the 20-year mark again for the move of God. Are you still with me? We're there. 
we're there unless lest the church sleep right through it because we've gotten so entangled in our own vines of humanism and perversion. And see, what you've got to understand is God says I'm looking. And by the way, if you take, if you kick out one third person, a third person of the Trinity, which most people don't even understand, that until you truly step into the being of God and step into the being of the Son and then step into the being of the Holy Spirit, you do not have a well-grounded Christian life. All three are three separate experiences that equal one. I don't have time to go into that, but it's 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 a depth of understanding the Holy Spirit and understanding who he is as a person. It's 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 realizing who he is. He's not just here so you can dance and get your frills with him. He is. You need to understand. Do not pervert the gospel by making him just some gift. He's bigger than that. He is a person. And and so but when you remove when we kick out one third of the Holy Spirit, one third from 100 is 33, 33.337333 to infinity. But 33 three from a hundred leaves the number six 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 and that is why in first john it says the spirit of the antichrist came from within the church it is a spirit that says i want knowledge without power i want approval without repentance i want church growth without seeing souls saved. So we've moved into a season of sanctifying demons. And the fullest the church will ever be will be the day after the rapture. And why am I sharing this with you? Because this is not new. You need to understand. That's why I'm preaching about the Simeon cry because the stuff that I have got where the Lord, I told you he shifted me four years ago and he took me from the fun, cool, neat, youth guy that spoke all over the world and the big conventions and he said no 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 from this point on you will herald my glory because you need to understand suddenlies are always preceded by obedience and when the Lord began to speak that to me he said I'm not done with America yet I will pour out my spirit again and everything Jesus prophesied is taking place right now you still understand that right but we are living in a season of darkness but neither humanism nor perversion can harm God's plan for the church unless the church no longer sees it as dangerous and embrace it as, as truth and culture is trying to rewrite God's word but oh that's a very dangerous thing to try to rewrite his word according to Revelation chapter 4 because then you're in danger of hellfire it's a okay if I preach like this here but we've moved into the time of 2 Timothy where he said you're going to find that, that there, there's coming a day there will be times when people will have no stomach for solid teaching but will fill up on spiritual junk food catchy opinions that tickle their fancies they'll turn their backs on truth and chase after the mirages everybody say truth See, we love the Holy Spirit because he comforts us and paracletes us. It means he lawyers us. He takes care of us. He fights our battles. But if you really study who the Holy Spirit is, the number one job of the Holy Spirit is to lead you to truth. And by the way, the word truth in the Hebrew is three letters. It's the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the middle letter, and the last letter. Now, we all know that the Hebrew alphabet is just all even numbers. But follow me for a second. The word truth is in the Hebrew is three letters. And you'll find it at the very beginning. Uh, you'll find it in the very middle. And you'll find it at the very end because truth doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Are you with me? But truth is now the new hate speech. And if you get persecuted for the truth, which I have been, well, you're fulfilling prophecy. And Charles Spurgeon said, discernment is not knowing the difference between right and wrong, but it's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Why am I preaching about this tonight? Because I am learning that when you lose your purpose, you embrace passivity. And we are living there as a nation right now. And sitting Christians hatch hypocrites. And God says, I'm looking for someone that will rise up and lead. And I'm going to be honest with you. As I get very real with you, Pastor James, and will admit this, there are days in ministry that it's exhausting. Where I get up in a hotel room and I just say, I'm just still glad to be here. That I didn't trip over my flesh somewhere. That I didn't harm my family somewhere. That I didn't get caught up in the demons that chased my family because I locked that door. Somebody give my God a praise right now. He ain't coming back in. That's why I don't drink. I get, uh, recently, somebody, it's been a, about a year or so, but a very well-known person said to me, because I said something about drinking alcohol, and a very well-known person tweeted me and said, Pat, you're just religious. And I tweeted him back, because I love him, and I said, I would rather be considered religious than be in rehab. I know my family. <laughs> Wrong person to debate with. Been to too many funerals. But there are days that it's exhausting, and that's why I must share for just a few minutes about the Simeon cry. What is the Simeon cry? What is the Simeon cry? I'm going to hurry. I'm not going to go much longer. That's my first lie to you. <laughs> Watch. What's the Simeon cry? 
It's a personal cry. That eventually leads to a public proclamation. I want you to go with me now for just a second. I'm going to describe. I, I tend to take you on a journey when I preach. And you don't know who I am. But this is my style. I just believe in making the word come alive like a movie. I really do. I love that. And, 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 and as I begin to study that, sitting on the plane, the Lord took me on a journey. Go with me to the temple in Jerusalem, which is about to be announced very soon that they're going to rebuild it. That's about to happen. I, yeah, it's going to. I need you to know. I know personally. Receive the phone call. And when that happens, ha, <laughs> ha, look towards the sky. Your redemption draweth nigh. And don't be like Lot's wife, Luke chapter 17, who looked back, Jesus said, but get on the roof because I'm coming back like lightning. But go with me, if you would, to, to, the, to the temple. And in the temple there, off to the side, there's a, there's a small room. And in this room is where the priest lived. And in this room was what many believe, according to the Orthodox Church, which this church was a part of the Orthodox Church many years ago, many believe a man by the name of Simeon was 200 years old. I imagine his ears didn't work like that. I imagine his ears were dull. His, his vision was blurred. I imagine his body ached. He's 200. He's, he's just trying to stay alive because he's been given a promise. And all God's promises are yes and amen. And some of you think because God didn't do it in your time zone, you forgot that he's already living in your tomorrow. That somewhere along the way, he forgot you. But he was crucified between two thieves yesterday and tomorrow. He lives in your present. And so you have to understand understand that God says you need to realize that I'm looking for those that won't give up just because it's gotten quiet it's in the quiet that God is working Daniel prayed for 21 days and the spirit of the Lord came to him and said I heard your, your, your prayer on the first day but I'm doing war for you give me a chance man that's what he was saying but what I love about Simeon is he had had a revelation from the Lord. I imagine he wasn't like all the other preachers of the day that just preach politics and make Rome mad. Because see, he understand that your position should never, should, should never determine your passion. But your passion will determine your position. And so you have to understand, according to God's word, one day he is translating God's word. This is Luke chapter 2. He's translating God's word. And he's, he's part of the Septuagint, although it had not been named that yet. But he's translating from the Greek from the Hebrew into the Greek koine and all of a sudden he trips over a word this is why he was so passionate he trips over Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 and he gets there you know what I've learned your faith will never grow until your normal gets interrupted some of you are binding the devil but it's Jesus interrupting you and that's why he says he subjects us to frustration read the Bible Therefore, the Lord himself, he's writing, he's translating. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and the virgin will conceive and will give birth to a son and call him God with us. At that exact moment, now look over at Luke chapter 2, verse 25, because we're going somewhere. At that exact moment, all of a sudden, an angel of the Lord appears to him and says, Simeon, you will see it. <laughs> And he freezes. He drops the pen. Starts to shake. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. I could stop and preach on that all day long. Because we don't even talk about righteousness. Everybody wants the wealth and everything. But they don't understand all through the word of God. Everything is tied to righteousness. It's like, hey, if you'll give $100, you'll get $1,000. But they don't ever mention on those great little Christian television shows. But you have to be righteous. Because that's the soil. What does righteousness mean? It means my character doesn't change when your mood does. And devout. You know what devout means? I'm in this thing, man. You can do whatever you want, but it's going to hit me like Flint. I'm bouncing off of it because I've set my face like Flint. I'm not walking away. I'm not coming to church when I feel like it. I'm going to have my family here because the day that I miss is the day I would have got my encounter. I'm in this thing. I'm going to show up early. I'm going to leave late. I'm going to lock the doors. That way, if I'm the last one to leave, I know the Holy Ghost is going with me. See, there's an understanding that all of a sudden the Spirit of the Lord has anointed you for a next level. It was righteous and devout. And he was waiting for the consolation. Now, I looked up the word consolation. Consolation, 
because I thought it's what you get when you don't win. You didn't win the car, so here's a teddy bear. So I looked at the word consolation. And the word consolation is a description of Jesus, summons for help, impartation, encouragement, comfort, or an answer. Everything that Jesus is. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel. And it had been revealed to him by the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Are you still with me? And this interruption changed everything. And I'm hurrying. I'm almost done. And then the Bible says he was moved by the Spirit. Everybody say moved by the Spirit. See, I've learned that it's in the waiting that your motives are revealed. I've learned when no one's talking about you, no one's bragging on you, nobody's telling you you're great, that you, you find out your motives, young preachers. And that encounter changed everything. And in Luke 2, verse 27, moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts to do for the child what was custom of the law. And it says they brought Jesus in. I love that it says he moved by the Spirit, not moved by the crowd, not moved by the lights. I get so tired of speaking at large conferences where the, the host leans over to me and says, what do you think about my lights? We think about the stage. We spend a lot of money on it. We think, and I just want to look at him and say, dude, I don't care about the aesthetics. I want the anointing. Shut up. And see, what you behold, you become. And what you got to realize is he's waiting to behold something. So he couldn't look every other direction. You got to get a hold of what I'm talking about. And, and can I just say something? And I'm speaking this to somebody. If we have to continue to remind you uh, of the cross, you've yet to take it up. But he wasn't like those. It says, moved by the Spirit. He wasn't like those who treat God as some weekend warrior experience. He wasn't like those who treat God as some ministry paycheck, parking place, and 401K. No, 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 no. Or excuse me, 403B. It's a nonprofit. And so he, he, he wasn't like those. He wasn't like those that, that, get, that are satisfied with seeing God's glory through someone else's eyes. That's why Paul said, not only in 2 Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians chapter 3, but Hebrews chapter 5. It proves he wrote Hebrews. And that's why Paul said, though, though by this time you ought to be, you ought to be teaching, but you're still... A student, and it proves Paul wrote Hebrews. But, but, uh, and then, and then he goes on to say, but, and he goes on to say, but you ought to be eating meat, but you're still you're drinking milk. You know what milk is? Milk is something digested by someone else. You get milk on Sunday, you get meat in the prayer closet, and you build your muscles. But you've got to understand the problem is some of us are, are just so happy because what if the Holy Spirit hits me? It might embarrass my flesh a little bit. My Bible says that when He walks in the room, my God, my Bible says my flesh cannot glory. In in his presence that means all of my thoughts we think flesh is this stuff no 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 no. flesh means carnal spirit it means bad breath and so what you got to understand is that's what the word the carnal spirit means it means bad breath right i sat by that guy on the plane today but you got to understand it's that understanding that when you walk into the presence of god have i gone too long he wasn't like those who put God in a box and pull him out on Sunday, America. He wasn't like those. And this is it. The only persecution we have right now in America is prosperity persecution because we think God didn't buy the car we wanted. There are other nations that are losing their heads right now. I was praying the other morning and I said, if you tell me I'll get on a plane, I'll go to Syria and I'll go into Iraq and preach. I'll die. Nothing left. I just want him. I've been on all the stages and they've left me wanting. But he recognized his moment, and this is where I close. Sarah, would you come help me? The enemy wants your moment. Some of you get so close to your miracle, and the enemy keeps interrupting it. See, I'm learning that when God shows up, it isn't about you. You know what he says to me every time I get on stage, nearly every time? He always says to me, go be a stagehand, open the curtain. If they can see you, they can't see me.
But I'm learning that God was never gonna, God's never going to walk into a service where we're going to take credit for it. <laughs> but the enemy's trying to distract some of you. I've been there. I know what that's like. The Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, it says, Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't, think that, don't jump to the conclusion that God is not on the job. Instead, be glad that you're in a very thick of things. Of what Christ experienced. This is your spiritual refining process. And then look what it says in the next part. It says, it says all of a sudden you're going to turn the corner. And glory is going to hit you. He's running in the balcony. I see you, Lord. <laughs> and all of a sudden, he walks into church that morning. I bet he was tired. You know what? It was probably the Sunday he wanted to stay home. This is the way I imagine it. I'm going to rent the video when I get to heaven. But all of a sudden, he turns the corner. And they're lined up to meet him. I mean, my God, he's pastored them 200 years. He's married them and buried them. They all know him. Orthodox Church. See, there's something that a Hebrew woman has to do. I'm, I'm German Jew, so... Number one, a child is circumcised at eight days old. My grandson was circumcised at eight days old. And but there's something called candlemas. Candlemas is this. It's an orthodox word, but it's a purification ceremony. When a child is 40 days old, they're given their name at eight days old when they're circumcised, but at 40 days old, they're taken and presented at the temple. And the mother has to be anointed because she's considered unclean because she gave birth to a boy. Mary's Candlemas is celebrated on February 2nd, but Simeon's death is celebrated on February 3rd. All of a sudden, he walks into the courtyard, and they're lined up to meet him, and they're, Pastor, Pastor, he's, he's, he's waving at him. And by the way, if, 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 if my friend James ever walks in here and he doesn't look at you and say hi, he's not being rude. He has a word from the Lord. So get over your flesh and realize that it ain't about you. That's called mature Christianity. It's very rare in the body of Christ today. Because we church hop and we treat God like he's some orphan house parent as if we can go from church to church to church and jump and jump and jump until somebody just entertains me enough so now really all we have is foster homes uh where's michael didn't a little girl walk up to me last night and say i'm uh so and so i'm a foster child and i grabbed her and i said no you're not you're a child of the king remember that last night that was fun wasn't it So he walks into the courtyard and everyone's greeting him and they're 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 greeting him. And they're greeting him, and they're greeting him and, but something is stirring inside of him. This isn't a normal Sunday. This isn't a normal day. This is, I'm going to stay right here on that fan, my God. And they're, 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 they're greeting him. Hello, pastor. Hello, pastor. But something's different. Something's different. This is the way I imagine it. Something's different. Something's different. And he starts walking and he sees somebody down there, but he can't make him out. You know, he's old and, and he's, he sees him, but he can't really tell but he said hi good to see you good, good to see you um and as he gets closer he sees a couple he knows them because he's heard the gossip prayer request he knows them and they're holding something they pastor Flint. And all of a sudden he looks into the eyes of the father, the man standing down there, the dad, and he goes, Hello, Pastor. And he looks at the face of the little girl, and a tear rolls down her face, a tear of vindication. Finally, someone believes. And as he gets closer, he notices they're holding 
And as he smiles, he gets closer and he gets up to me. He says, hello, welcome to church today. Can I hold him? Excuse me, ma'am. Can I hold your baby? Here it comes. Get ready. And all of a sudden, Mary, Mary smiles and says, sure, pastor. And as he reached out his arms, the warmth of a child's body filled his hands. He pulls back the little blanket and he looks down and he goes, oh, the angel of the Lord, the spirit of the Lord says, that's him. The lion of the tribe of Judah. The rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the bright morning star, the I am that I am, the will within the will, the fourth man in the fire. And as he takes the baby, oh, you're not getting what I'm saying. He was saying, excuse me, ma'am, can I hold healing to the nations? Can I hold the word made flesh? John chapter 1. Every part of your Bible was inside of that baby. Can I hold healing for my family? Can I hold the curse breaker? Can I hold the I am that I am? Can I hold the bright and morning star? Can I hold the day star that shines down upon us? And all of a sudden as he takes the child, he begins to hold him up in the air. And I bet every animal in creation right here in Connecticut suddenly went Tush. And as he held the baby up in the air, it was a circle of life moment. And at that exact, oh, you're not getting this, you're not getting this, you're not getting this, you're not getting this yet. I wish you'd get excited because there comes a moment, there comes a moment. And Luke chapter 2, verse 28, sick him, uh, Simeon took him in his arms and he says, I can't die now. Because it was his last sermon. It had to be because every one of the Pharisees standing around would have already put him on a death warrant list. He was done. They were whispering to him, you see that old fool? He finally cracked. He finally thinks he's holding the Messiah. But I can see as he held the baby, he began to rub his little feet, which will someday, which, I, which carried my cross, but will someday step between the Mount of Olives and the Gate Beautiful and split it. Begin to rub him on his side in which I was grafted him. Begin to rub his little shoulders in which the government sits upon. Begin to, begin to rub his brow which would be pierced for my thought life. Begin to rub his face which was beat for my identity. Begin to rub his head which would swell up as it was pierced. Begin to rub his back in which stripes would come for my healing. Begin to rub his hands in which Colossians says nailed my sin to the tree. Oh my God, I wish you'd get a hold of this. And I can see the Pharisees as they begin to mock him. This was his last sermon. The religious leaders were mocking him. Why? Because they were so used to preaching that he was coming, they missed that he arrived. Yeah, 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 yeah. They were so used to declaring the Messiah was coming that they missed that he had arrived. But the remnant is decided at all costs. We will not quit on the one who would not quit on me. There's a revolution coming. A revolution of nobodies. The unqualified remnant who are thirsty. And the Bible says, I'm done. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and he said to Mama, he said, Mary, this child is destined to cause the rising and the falling of many in Israel and the, their thoughts and hearts will be revealed. But then he goes on to say, but listen, Mary, someday, he's being a pastor, he's a shepherd, someday it's going to stab you in the heart. And then I can see he's laughing. And he 
takes the baby and hands it back to him and says, now the prophet of the house, Anna's coming to see you, but I got to go. They're coming for me. I got to go. And I could see as he says, thank you for being a vessel that housed the glory. Because he puts his treasures in jars of clay in the earthen vessels for the all-surpassing glory. Glory can shine through. And then I can see as he moves, he smiles and says, I love you, I love you, I gotta go, I gotta go. They're coming. And I can see him running across the courtyard laughing. And then all of a sudden he runs into his little apartment, he shuts the door. He sits on the side of the bed. You keep your word. You kept your Sit in. Let us in. I gotta go. Shuts his eyes. And he awakens to what Isaiah saw in the sixth chapter. Holy, holy, holy. Holy is the Lamb. See, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, I believe it is. That were changes we behold him. He's holy. When is the last time he brushed by you? He'll do it. He's here. He's here. In this house, you have one of the greatest orators in history. One of the purest men I've ever met. I love him. There's no guile. That's why I named my son Nathaniel. There's no guile. There's no fakeness. But there's people in this room that God has been waiting to run into. That he's anointed for now. I guess I should close. Stand up across the house if you physically can. But don't slip out. That's so cowardly. Unless you have to go to work. We respect that. I always get angry and I want to say, and I can say it here because it's safe. How can people walk out when he carried my cross forward, not backward? But I don't do that because then I don't get invited back and we got to pay the bills. It's going to get it. It's going to hit you. It's about 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 to hit you. You need to quit watching so much YouTube. It's messing with you. Is he here? <laughs> the mother of the house. You better ask their permission. James said, see, I guarantee you when Simeon went to pick up Jesus, he wasn't holding the scrolls. He was holding nothing. And if you're going to touch the anointing, you better have clean hands. And the Lord is about to restore himself to some of you. You're going to begin to have dreams and visions. I have a sleep disorder called Revelation. You know why? Because before I go to bed at night, I say, wash my eyes. So here's what we're going to do across the house right now. The Spirit of the Lord is here strong. Do you feel him? You been waiting on an encounter? Okay, I want you to do something for me. Stretch your hands like this. Yep. Stay in like that. Say, excuse me, Father. Can I? Hold your glory. Oh. That's what's going to happen in a minute. That's what's going to happen. He's here. <laughs> but 
first we must wash our hands. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a water fountain that's filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. So if you have sin in your life or you've allowed perversion in your life or anything that took the place of God as superior in your life, maybe it's money or finances or fear or anger or hurt or perversion, whatever it is. I mean, come on. You say, Pat, I need to get some stuff out of my life. I've been absent the encounter for a while, man. If you say I've had things in my life, raise your hand now. Be honest. Come on. I, I, come on. Don't lie in the presence of the Lord. I mean, that's foolishness. Take both your hands and hold them in the air. And say, Jesus, say it boldly. Come on. When you say his name, you say it with bold fire. Hold on one second, Sarah. No music. Just for a second. Say, Jesus, I need you to say it where the homeless down the street can hear it. Jesus! The Bible says, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So simply say this. Say, help! Me. He's in front of you. The Bible says if I confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, I am completely saved at that moment. The problem is we do a lot of confessing without a lot of believing. He has to do open heart surgery on us. So say this out loud. Say, Father, convict me of the things in my life that are not of you. You must be Lord. You must be preeminent. I receive you. At a highest level, overwhelm me with your love. It's your goodness that makes me want to change. So today, hold your hands up. Say, I wash. It's going to get heavy now. I need your hands. Your hands. Say, I wash. Now start washing your hands in the blood. You're going to see the blood washing stuff off you because James says, wash your hands. Cleanse your heart. Purify your mind. No more double-mindedness. Come on, wash your hands. Wash your hands in the presence of the Lord. I'm not being weird. Do your hands just like, that, like you're under a water fountain. Do this. Say, I wash my hands. Because you're about to hold something very holy and sacred, and you can't touch the anointing if you aren't clean. So, so wash your hands. Say, Lord, Lord, say, Lord. I repent. Say, God, I repent. I repent. I wash my hands. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something. I want you to look at me for a second because it's going to get more thick. But I don't want you to do this till you get down here because it might get dangerous because these pews are old and they hurt. And so I, I need you to know. I need you to know God's about to move. So from the very front to the very back, including my tech guys, my guys that are traveling with me that drove all night. And then they got to drive all night tomorrow night and get on a plane to Singapore. I need all y'all too. But so everyone, would you, if you physically can't stand, the front row is for you. But I need everyone. Sarah, you can go ahead for just a second. But I'm going to probably stop you about 12 times. And so. Would everyone in the house come walking down now? Come on, come on, come stand down here. Come on, come on, come on. Come on. Come on, closer, closer, closer. Lord to thee. Oh, did I tell you that you might trip over them on your way down? So if that happens, that happens. Come close, come close, friends. He is here. This freaks you out. This is normal. Songs of the Lord come forth. Okay, let's do this. Take your hands in front of you. And say, Jesus is my Lord. Now I want you to lean your hands out a little bit. We're going to do what Simeon did. I'm warning you, I'm warning you, I'm warning you, I'm warning you. If you fall, fall forward so you don't hurt nobody. But if you don't fall, stand up. We ain't nobody going to push you over. We don't play that game here. We don't need help. The Holy Spirit has never asked me to help him like that. So lean forward and say, everyone say it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to hit you now. You ready? You're ready, right? Right, 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 right. You're going to get peace. You're going to get your peace back. You get your peace. Go sleep good. Sleep good. Stretch your hands out and say, excuse me, Father. Can I? I'm warning you now. Hold on one second. Hold on. I want you to do this. Excuse me, Father. I'm warning you. I know what I say. 
Excuse me, Father. Can I hold your glory? For some, it's instant. For others, it's a journey, but it's going to happen. You thought it slid through your hands. No way. Tonight's the night we get new gifts. Kind of warning you. Hands are going to start burning for healing anointing. You're going to begin to prophesy, speak word of knowledge. You're probably going to make mistakes when you start out doing it, but be patient. Stretch your hands out again and say, excuse me, Father. Can I hold peace? Say, excuse me, Father, can I hold joy? Oh, <laughs> I got my joy back about three months ago. My son was preaching, and it hit, man. I just laughed and laughed. My son was preaching, and I am remnant. I walked on stage. I couldn't quit laughing. I said, Lord, what's happened to me? He said, when your sister died eight years ago, you lost your joy. I'm giving it back. <laughs> Who's got lost children and it breaks your heart? The enemy stole your seed. He cannot have your seed. It is not his. See, if you got lost children, say, excuse me, Father, can I hold my baby's salvation? If you need a financial miracle, say, excuse me, Father. Oh, my goodness. I saw an interruption in your family. I saw an interruption in your parents. I saw an interruption in the house that was anointed. And the enemy stepped in and stole. And the Lord says, I'm giving you the key back. The key, 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 the key. The key, the key. <laughs> saw the interruption. The interruption came in. Tore a chapter out of the book. Wasn't supposed to happen. Stretch your hands out one more time. Excuse, excuse me, Father. Can I experience your love anew? Here it is. It just hit you. Cry out to God across the room. I release you to pray in the Holy Ghost. Pray in the tongues right now. Pray in the Spirit. The Lord is encountering his people. The Lord is encountering his, his people. I feel him. He's calling this house back to worship. The rest, stretch your hands out and say, excuse me, Lord. Can we hold revival? <laughs> Welcome. Holy Spirit, we are in your presence, fill us with your power, live inside of me. I hear the sound of finances coming in here on the camel's backs. If you need healing in your body, stretch your hands out right now. The Lord will heal you. Everywhere we go, people get healed. We have people healed of cancer, all kinds of crazy stuff. Say, excuse me, Lord. <laughs> Would you heal me? 
Receive healing now. Receive healing. Pastor James, would you join me? Hear the sound of the trumpet of the Lord over the America saying, wake up. Hear the sound of the trumpet of the Lord over the nations saying, wake up. Hear the sound of the thunder of God saying judgment is at hand. Wake up. Wake up. I'm at your door. Do something for me. Would you just appease me if you would. Reach out. Grab the handle of the door and turn it. Open the door. There's a visitor who's about to overwhelm you, and the Holy Spirit is going to tackle you now. Hear the sound of the freedom. Hear the sound of the worshipers calling out. Now's the time. Pour out your glory, pour out your glory, Lord, pour out your glory. Him, would you say that? I can see the rain again is coming down in the house. Just sing that. I don't know why, but just sing. I can see the rain again. It's coming down. <laughs> it's in the house. A little bit louder now we say, I can see the rain again. It's coming down. It's in the house. Oh, we say, I can see the rain again. It's coming down. Now say there's no more drought. There's no more drought. <laughs> I can see the rain again. It's coming down. No more drought. Hold on. There's a river coming into the sanctuary. No, no, no. I just saw it. It's coming through the back door. It's not here yet. It's not here yet. There's a river. The temple of the Lord, the river. It's in the middle. It's making its way up. Like when you watch a room get flooded, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. It's, coming. it's at your back feet back there. It's hitting your feet. It's hitting your feet. Now it's beginning to come in. It's coming in. It just hit. It just hit. It's hit. It's starting to splash like you see coming down a dry riverbed all over the room. The whole front is beginning to be filled up with the Lord's glory and the river of God. I just saw it. I just saw the river. I just saw the river of the Lord all over this house. Said, yalla, yalla, yalla. Come on, just stomp your feet in it. Get wet, get wet, get wet. Stomp your feet in it. I'm not weird. I'm not weird. I'm not weird. Man, come on. I can see the rain again. It's coming down. I feel it now. 
I feel it now a little bit louder. I can see the rain again. It's coming down. Hey, yeah. I feel it now. We're going to take it to another level. Lift your hands and say, I can feel his rain on me. I feel it now. I'm overwhelmed. Come on, pray in the Holy Ghost all over the room. Let it rain. Come on. Come on. over every city in New England, God. You know, I feel that I mean, there could not be a more timely word, I believe, for New England in this house than tonight. Um, I believe this place will not be the same after that word. And I, as I'm standing here tonight and we're, we're, this Simeon cry is coming out, I just, I feel like that, that net was, came off the lion. 
and I'm sitting here in I believe the Lord is telling me New England is about to receive its inheritance again. I do. Let me tell you something. This land is not supposed to make sense to the nation. Do you understand me? I'm okay when speakers land and tell me there's really nothing over here. I'm okay with that. Because I know something, friends. God is not looking to replicate what happened somewhere else. We are standing on the doorpost of history in this place tonight. And God is going to have his way again. He's going to reignite these fires of awakening. Nowhere in history has truth had more conviction behind it than in this place right here. And it, it befounds my mind when I read and, and study revivals. But gosh, tonight God came through with a word again and conviction fell in this place. And I'm telling you, a gift of revelation is going to be released over New England. I'm not talking about spooky stuff. I mean the word of God coming alive again. And it's going to come forth with preaching and conviction. And it's going to cause change when it hits this ground. And souls will be coming into the harvest and miracles will be made manifest. But we're receiving that tonight. My eyes are being so opened in this moment to what we've been given, church. And I'm, I don't want somebody else to come into this land and open our eyes. Friends, we are standing on history. God is giving us this land. There's been too many prayers and too many things that have went on. But I'm saying, God, show us what we really have. At the men's breakfast, we talked about being chosen. Man, we better act like it. Chosen people, choose them. And live that way. And I feel tonight something absolutely... You know, I had this vision. I, I don't go to chiropractors and I don't like them. But there was one dude in Michigan that was like a chiropractor and a pastor. And my wife's like, my mom sent me to a chiropractor. Do you know what I mean? And, and she's like, try it. I'm not talking about cracking your back. If I hug you properly, I'm going to bust it. This dude sat me in a chair. Don't ever try this at home. I don't know if he's done this. Did somebody ever grab your neck and just grip it? This dude tells me to relax. I'm like, I'm naturally tense, bro. How do I even? He's like, if you don't relax, I'll do it wrong. And this dude, like, that made me more tense. And he basically just like, like, it was so weird. He just like ripped my neck and all this sound busted out. And all of a sudden when he was done, like I could completely move. I don't know if you've ever had that. It's pretty weird. I had full mobility in my neck. It was like, wow, I'm not tense. It was like the lid lifted. And I feel like tonight Jesus just gave us an adjustment. I really believe that with all my heart. I believe tonight he adjusted the church over New England. And I'm crazy enough to believe that it's just the beginning. You know, I've had so many men and women of God prophesy about every single seat in this place being full. And every church being exploding with people. But I think it's about time we see it. Because I don't want anybody else to come in here. When we begin to believe what we have. And we begin to receive that promise. And that Simeon cry comes out of us. I believe that's when it's, we're going to begin to see the fulfillment of it. So, Father, tonight, we thank you for that word. Oh, my Lord. We thank you for that word spoken on the foundation of this house. And, God, as we stand in a room full of history, God, we thank you that the greatest chapter had not yet been written. That, God, you are going to release an awakening on this land, and we believe it's begun. And we are going to see the fulfillment of this land being shaken by you. And, Father, we thank you that your fire is going to burn again. Your truth will stand, God. That it's not going to be what is popular, but it's going to be what is true. And, God, we thank you that you are going to manifest your presence on this place. And your word is going to be backed up with your presence. And that it's going to be flames of fire released out of New England to shake this world. And it's going to be men and women living with the burning of holiness that you walked in that your message will not be compromised father we receive that call tonight god we receive that word tonight god oh seal it in this place father jesus
We're going to continue to worship. I still believe God is doing heart surgery. I still believe God is digging deep tonight. So I don't want to end this. If you need to be blessed, we love you. Tomorrow morning, Pat will be here at 11. And I just have a feeling that we're not, we're not going to do much tomorrow because he's going to release another word. But I don't want you to miss that. But if, if, you're, if God's not finished with some of you tonight. So we're going to worship for a little while. And I want you to let the Holy Spirit touch you. I don't want you to worry about anybody to your left or right. And I want you to say, Jesus, whatever other area that you've got to receive him, I want us to do that tonight. Come on. You provide the fire. I'll provide the sacrifice. You provide the spirit. 